Now, I blame the Balfour Declaration in this sense, that uh, I think a lawyer could uh, prove that the two obligations undertaken in it were compatible, but um, perhaps it's only hindsight. Perhaps you can't blame the um, British government at the time too much for not having foreseen this at the moment, though I do blame them all the same. Both communities were going to uh, interpret this in uh, ways that were incompatible with each other. Palestine's made into a, entered the so-called A class, which were to be prepared for self-government and complete sovereign independence. The Arabs, being more than 90%, naturally thought that when Palestine became independent, it would be an Arab state with a Jewish minority. The Jews, or some of the Jews, there was great controversy among different uh, branches of um, Zionists and uh, other Jews over this, interpreted the national home as merely a kind of halfway house towards the a Jewish state, and some, I'm afraid, said even if that's not what the British meant, we're going to use this as a lever for having a Jewish state in the end. Very human, I'm not blaming them too much for that, but uh, anyway, I myself think that the Balfour Declaration was right in uh, putting this uh, limitation. You may say it's like the pint of flesh and the drop of blood in the Merchant of Venice, that uh, if uh, there was to be no detriment to the interests of the 90% non-Jewish existing population, uh, you couldn't have much of a Jewish home. You could have a cultural one, but you certainly couldn't have a political one. Uh, I think that was the conditions were accepted by the Zionist organization at the time and were laid down by the British, and which uh, gave the Jews something that was very near their heart's desire and uh, did... Uh, uh, on paper, safeguard the interests of the existing inhabitants of the country, which uh, on all grounds of law and uh, morality one uh, should do. On the statute of limitations, which has a certain legal connotation, it also has in this context a connotation history. I'd like to quote you, Professor. In your study you say the Jews live on the same peculiar people long after Phoenicians and the Philistines lost yeah. their identity yeah. like all the nations. The ancient Syriac neighbors of Israel have yeah. fallen into the melting pot and yeah. have been reminted in the fullness of time with new images and superscriptions, while Israel has proved impervious to this alchemy performed by history in the crucibles yeah. of universal states yeah. and universal churches yeah. and wanderings of the nations. Extremely eloquent description, if I may say so, of Jewish survival. This statute of limitations was not recognized by history. We are the only people today in the Middle East speaking the same language, practicing the same religious faith, living in the same category of aspiration, spiritual continuity, as our forefathers thousands of years ago, as those who were exiled from there. There's nobody else from 132 of the common era in that category, in terms of continuity. Well, it was... Mr. Ambassador, recognised by history, wasn't it, in this very practical sense that... Um, it's the Balfour Declaration. Um, no, that by 1917, um, uh, more than 90% of the population of uh, Palestine uh, were not Jews. That is the work of history de facto. Another work of history de facto is the continuing uh, memory of the Jews of Palestine and uh, their memory of Palestine and their hope for a return. But uh, the Balfour Declaration, he takes account of both these... Yes, I, I, I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. On the question of historical association, yeah. you recognize, Professor, that there was a continuous Jewish residence in the land of Israel. Yeah. The return yeah. became the goal of the national life down the ages. It is also a fact that the Arabs never had Palestine as a separate political entity. It was controlled from remote caliphates for a number of centuries passed from hand to hand, 13 conquests down the ages. As the Middle East came to life in terms of the development of new nations, a process beginning after World War I, which has continued to our time and was consummated in the 40s and early 50s, the international consciousness recognized that the Arab peoples deserve nationhood and deserve independence deserve to achieve independence from the torpor of yeah. centuries and conquest. Yeah. <coughs> and eight Arab states came into being covering an area of close to two million square miles. They've achieved independence as status without precedent, possibly even in the golden days of the caliphate. Within that category of the Middle East, it was recognized that the Jewish people, having longed and lived for its return, should establish itself once again independence and freedom in the land of Israel. 
Now, you have an interpretation, sir, of the Balfour Declaration based on your association work at the time, British government. But surely you will acknowledge that Lord Balfour himself, Lloyd George, Prime Minister of the government, Winston Churchill, surely they should know what was meant by the Balfour Declaration, and they've clearly stated so down the years. And indeed, Amir Faisal, whom you met at the peace conference, he too recognized implicitly in his whole approach. Not the Jewish state. Well, I haven't got the pact here, mm. but it's certainly implicit. But in any event, those responsible for the Balfour Declaration have clearly defined its purpose. Uh, there's talks there of religious and civil rights of other inhabitants, and on that there's never been any question. But the basic issue here is the Arab peoples, having achieved a patrimony over eight countries and independence, for millions of square miles, should not begrudge the Jewish people a state of 8,000 square miles which can work in peace and cooperation with them. Now, originally, the mandate related to both Palestine and Transjordan. In 1921, four-fifths was cut off and Jordan became independent. Well, developed independence. The Emirate of Transjordan. So you had a further attempt to satisfy the Arab approach. And so over the years, the situation developed as it did. Now, if you look at it today, we hold neither land nor resource, water, any other resource which our Arab neighbors need for survival or advancement. Only blessing can come from cooperation, not only for us, also for them. But history has set certain principles in the approach to the whole problem of the Middle East. We have, down the ages, prayed and believed that our restoration would come, that independence would be restored, that within that context of independence, we again could make our contribution to mankind. This has taken place in our time. We believe that there are among Arab circles people who subconsciously appreciate this. But they've got to be encouraged that any attempt to raise old claims without relevance to the present situation, and we'll talk later on of the future, I think are very helpful in that regard. We can either pass now, sir, to the fossil business, or... Uh, Mr. Ambassador, if I may take up this last point. Uh, the provinces of Canada stretch even further than the eight Arab countries. They stretch from uh, ocean to ocean. So surely on the ambassador's argument, um, Canada should not uh, begrudge to the poor of Algonquin uh, such a little piece as, say, Montreal, because they've got such an awful lot left, even if uh, Montreal was given back to the Algonquins. I'm putting it in a joking form, but my serious point is that uh, uh, the fact that those uh, eight Arab countries are happily independent um, does not affect the uh, fate of the uh, Arabs who, who lived in what is now Israel, because uh, that is not part of the uh, Arab states. And the fact that other Arabs uh, have their independence and uh, can make their own future does not make the uh, former Arab inhabitants of what is now Israel any less uh, refugees and expatriates than they are at the, uh, uh, at the moment. On the Balfour Declaration, I must say explicitly that uh, I know that it was um, clearly understood at the time that uh, the national home was not intended to be a Jewish national state. And this was clearly stated to the Zionist organization by the British government at the time that the Balfour Declaration was um, issued. And uh, the declaration was accepted on those terms and the mandate was given by the League of Nations to uh, Britain on uh, those terms. I think Britain made an awful mess of the administration's mandate. Uh, we had taken on something perhaps beyond the capacity of any country to take on, never mind. The Jews could not have made the mistake at the time of believing that uh, the Balfour Declaration promised them a Jewish state. But it is a fact, Professor, I, again I say that I've read the interpretations given by those responsible for the Declaration, yes. and um, the consensus of world opinion of the time and the unfolding years after that. But certainly you will agree that the United Nations took a decision in November 1947 that there was to be a Jewish state in Palestine. And they took a decision later that the Arab refugees were to be repatriated that, into Israel. I, 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 they did not take such a decision, sir. Well, not take that, such a decision? No, no. 
They did not take a decision that the Arab refugees had to be repatriated to Israel. And uh, we can discuss this now if you wish, or go on with the fossil business. I'd like to discuss that, yes. Very good. Yes. <laughs> the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations, 1948, established a Palestine Conciliation Commission mm -hmm. to deal with the whole complex of problems mm -hmm. which had arisen between Israel and the Arab states. They were to serve as mediators, and the parties were also asked in the resolution they wish to go operate directly, in terms of direct contact, with a view to finding a solution of all these problems. Within the context of this resolution, the refugee problem is referred to. Uh, the Commission is supposed to study the possibilities either of repatriation or of resettlement or of compensation, but all this in part of a general context of a peace settlement. The resolution talks of return of refugees as soon as practicable. And it also talks of those refugees who wish to live in peace. This resolution has been dead now since 1948. Good. It has been dead, yes, it has been dead, because the Arabs have never announced that they would live in peace with Israel. They refuse to negotiate directly. And the PCC in fact, has been a defunct body for many years now. Now, what is our position on this? The Arab refugee problem, Professor, is one of a whole complex of refugee problems. I believe that since 1940, some 35 million people have been uprooted across the world. Yes. Korea, Vietnam, Germany, Finland. Yeah. Nearly all of these problems either have been solved or approaching solution. And in no case has the solution been through repatriation, but rather through absorption. Now, what have we said? We have said that we are prepared to pay full compensation. We have said we are prepared to consider a limited repatriation within a framework, reunion of families. But the problem will never move unless the Arab governments are prepared to cooperate in alleviating the suffering of the refugees. And the fact is, our figures, by the way, of the refugees are about 550,000. We have a basis to assume that some 160,000 have been absorbed. This is a unique problem. There's no economic difficulty. Money has been voted by the United Nations. There's a promise of the United States government for international loan. There's no social problem because they're living among their people. The Arab living today in a camp in Transjordan, he's not a Pole living in Britain. He's living in his own surroundings, part of the environment of arising Arab nationalism, religious, cultural, identity of background, and psychological. The problem will never move until the Arab governments are prepared to cooperate in a humanitarian solution. I notice, Professor, that you yourself have criticized the Arab governments. I have, yes. <clears throat> and you have said very rightly, in talking of suffering, referring back to our first, first part of the conversation, why don't they take them out of this parasitic existence? Why don't they set them up in farms and in villages and homes? Why keep them there as a political weapon? You who scan history over thousands of years, do you know of any other case, any precedent of holding hundreds of thousands of people as political hostage in camps, parasitic, no future, quenching the, the very sense of creativeness in them for what purpose? So they can be ready as part of political pawn for some ultimate program to exterminate Israel, God forbid. Is that more, is that an approach? Have you read the Secretary General of the United Nations, his report last year? He views the solution in terms of economic integration to the area. We will, of course, will play our part in it. We are very upset at this continued humanitarian problem. But it's not within our hands. We can't solve it. In Israel now, there are 10% Arabs, 200,000. They enjoy every right with their fellow Jewish citizens. 